जाना साधनी तुमारो संगे बेधे Shami Vivekananda, Sister Nivedita, P.C. Roy, Bandan Shoh, 
Romerola, Albert Einstein, Rob Rolle, Henry Cavendish, Okakura, and Mahatma Gandhi, of course, his association with uh, national movement. So Mahatma Gandhi used to visit him. And his notable students, all of us, Mengna Shah, S.N. Bosch, P.C. Mahula Navish, S.K. Mitra, D.M. Bosch, of course, D.M. Bosch was not. FRS, and there are others, I miss some others. All, see, these are notable instruments. Ajatimon also frequented by, I said, and played active role in the Bengal Renaissance during the 19th century and early 20th century. Mahatma Gandhi, one of them, and Rishi Aravandi used to visit, and some other dignitaries also used to visit here. This influenced immensely, this Renaissance, Bengal Renaissance influenced immensely transition of medieval India to modern India. And that laid the foundation, you saw the same. What is treasure in Ajatavan? Why it is so important? What are the treasures we have? Some of the treasures I will share with you. Rich repository of uh, personalia and memorabilia of Acharya Bosch, Lady Bosch, his original instruments, books, papers pertaining to his scientific discoveries. All these instruments are there in the Ajatavan. Last two instruments, you know, oscillating plant, phytogram, and compound labor, crescogram. These two instruments were sent to London Science Exhibition, which is celebrating the 5,000 years of, of uh, India's success in science and technology and other things. And our Honorable Prime Minister also visited the pavilion at that time. Next one. We have what we have. His DSC thesis. London University, his examiners were two Nobel laureates, J.J. Thompson and H. Ponting. He did not appear for any qualifying exam or training, etc. But he published two papers. These two gentlemen, they examined the papers and said that these two papers are enough to have all the requirements for getting the, confirming the degree. That was to me a tirtho kestro. So I am really honored that I have been asked to give this talk. So let's get going. So I am going to talk about the NASA technology to unravel the, the mysteries of the universe. What kind of technology we are developing? What kind of science that we are doing at NASA? So before I start, I want to uh, show it to you what NASA is, most of you know. Uh, so NASA has different centers all across the United States. So our headquarters is in Washington, D.C. But I am here at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Pasadena, California. So JPL is the largest NASA lab for robotic missions. All the missions that you hear going to Mars and going to Europa uh, very soon, they all are done from our lab. We have about 6,000 people. And many of you know Houston. Houston, you have a problem with a big space, right? So where we actually do about manned missions, so training facilities for all that all the astronauts are up there in Houston. And all other centers, they have their own role to play. So of course, this is we are here at uh, Jesse Moses, um, you know, what? Uh, what anniversary? So if you think about the contribution, you already heard from. Uh, about Jesse Bose and his contributions. So this is what he has done, the modern day communication that we all know about. Who doesn't have a smartphone in his or her pocket now? I don't think anyone can uh, find anyone who doesn't have a smartphone. But if you think about it, Jesse Bose actually led the way to modern communication. He was the pioneer in millimeter wave technology wireless technology. So everything, today everything is wireless. Without wireless technology, if the wireless was deep, we would not be here. Think about it. This smartphone that we have, we are carrying right now, has replaced all these things. Before we used to have telephone, we used to have fax machines, 
the camera, with the clock, everything has been replaced by one single line. That why that was possible because of the war that was the case in this field. And that is the big lesson. So we should be all thankful to him for what he has done. So I am so fortunate that I also work in the area of microwave and telehealth technologies, but we are actually using some of the techniques that was the case in this field. At the beginning, 1896, he did his experiments in 1896 for wireless communication before the electrons are discovered. Think about it. So he was a little bit ahead of his time. So let's start with about some science. This is the Big Bang Theory. This is not the Big Bang Theory you watch on TV. This is the real Big Bang. We believe that our universe started with the Big Bang about 13.85 billion years ago. And currently we are here. And if you actually want to look at all this wireless communication that I was talking about, that happens in using electromagnetic waves. So if you want to go back in time and try to understand that how our universe came about, what happened at the beginning of the universe, if you have to go back in time, you can go back only about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, because that is the, that is the time the first light of the universe came out. Before that, it was a big hot plasma. So nothing could come out. So actually it was discovered by two scientists, Penzias and Wilson. They were doing some millimeter wave communication uh, experiment at APIP Bell Lab in the late 60s, 1960s. And when they were doing some experiments, then they were finding that wherever they look, they find some extra noise in their receiver. You know, on your phone sometimes you hear the hiss noise, that is the noise. So they were finding that extra noise coming. And they couldn't understand what is going on. And then they started thinking about it and they realized that what they are looking at, what they were hearing, is the first light of this universe that is called cosmic micro background signal. So next time, if you are, a lot of students are here, I'm really so glad to see a lot of students. So students, if you are doing some experiments in your lab, and if you cannot explain what you see, like Kenzie and Wilson, don't think that it is experimental error. It, because it might be the Nobel Prize, you know, because both Penjas and Wilson won their World War Nobel Prize uh, for discovering the first life of the universe. So what do we do at NASA? That is a question that is asked often. So at NASA we do science. Yes, we develop technologies to do the science, but our main mission is to unravel the mysteries of the universe. We are trying to understand. We are trying to do our big, answer big science questions. One of the biggest science questions that we have currently is, are we alone in this universe? Is there life somewhere else outside our planet Earth? So whatever you read in the newspapers or some of the YouTube channels and all that, there are aliens are found here and they are, don't believe them because we have not found any sign of life as of today, anywhere outside of planet Earth, not even a single cell. So if someone tells you that they found an alien, please ask them to talk to us. We'll be very happy to we'll stop doing all this, you know, spending all this money. Uh, so that's, we'll be, that will be great. Now the question is that what is the possibility, what is the probability of finding life somewhere else, some other places? So my answer to that is that there is a distinct possibility of finding life somewhere else. So why do we say that? The reason is if you look in our sky, you know, you know the Calcutta is always you know, kind of cloudy and all this uh, smoke and smoke. So you cannot see the moon really very well. But if you go out of Kolkata and go somewhere else on a dark night, you'll see the Milky Way, Akash Ganga is called, Milky Way Galaxy. So in our Milky Way galaxy, we have about 100 billion stars, order of magnitude. 100 billion stands for about 10 to the power 11, 11 zeros after one. And in our universe, we have about 100 billion galaxies. And we are finding that many of these stars, most of these stars, they have planets 
and not only one planet, there are multiple planets around them. So then, what is the probability that we find one such planet in one of these you know, trillions of trillions of planets that conditions are such that life can exist? That has to be a finite probability, and that's what we are actually doing. So far, we have found more than 5,000 such exoplanets. They're called exoplanets. And we are looking for those planets who are, we call, they're in a habitable zone. Habitable zones are the places where the conditions are such that water can exist in liquid form on the surface. Why do I say that? Because when we are looking for life, we are looking for life that we need. We know our kind of life hydrocarbon based life and that's what we are looking for because if you are looking for someone might say that we will like of other kind yes but how to search for that you cannot search for something that you don't know about you know Rabindranath Tagore of course I'm a big fan of uh, Tagore and in any talk anything I try to hit Tagore somehow so Rabindranath Tagore wrote a beautiful song and one of the line is which means that we are actually trying to find the unknown with what we know. And that's what we are trying to do when we are looking for life. Because we, are, we know our kind of life, we know hydrocarbon based of life, that's what we are looking for. So you can, you can say that you say, right, there are trillions and trillions of uh, planets out there, how come we found only those out there? Because we have not really looked much. We are only looking at very narrow areas of old galaxy. So how do we find those planets? What is the technology that we use to find those exoplanets? One of the things we do is that suppose there is a star out there. And if you can isolate that total amount of light that is coming from that star, and if there is a planet going around, what happens is the as the planet goes in front of it, the total amount of light ever slightly dips. By measuring the change of total light that's coming in, we can say that, oh, there's a planet out there. And not only that, how much time it is going to take, from there we can calculate what is the orbit, from there we can say what is the uh, you know, mass of the star, and we can find out what is the entire volume of that, then we can say, okay, this is the density of the star, is it a rocky planet, or is it a gaseous planet like Jupiter? All of things we can learn just with this type of measurement. So we are looking for rocky planets because gaseous planets like Jupiter cannot sustain life. We found many of them, many, many of those uh, you know, planets we already discovered. And then what we are looking for, only problem is the nearest one that we found we can sustain life. It will take about 40 million years reach there with our current technology. So we cannot really go there today. So what we are doing is developing technologies to try to find out you know, what we can learn more about that. And I was saying that we are looking, this is our Milky Way galaxy, we have looked only in this narrow area of our own galaxy and found 5,000 planets. So the reason is we do not have that technology. We need better sensitive receivers. We need better you know, technology. And that's why students who are here today, I, um, I'll ask you to join us, join NASA, and join this as well, uh, and help us you know, developing the next generation of technology so that we can understand more. So those were the far off planets where there could be life. What about the whole solar system? Is there a possibility of life in our own solar system? Answer is yes. Look at this. This is Enceladus. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. And what is happening here, what you see if you expand, water is gushing out. So this was discovered by one of the instruments called Hi-Fi instrument or uh, NASA's Herschel Observatory. And I was very fortunate, I actually was part of the team that developed that instrument at NASA. Then we discovered that water is gushing out from Enceladus. Enceladus is a very cold planetary body. It's all ice. If that water, liquid water is coming out, which means there has to be a source of energy in that, that's keeping it liquid. So if there is water, if there is source of energy, 
their life. So what is this coming out from here? We don't know. So NASA is planning a trip to Enceladus sometimes in the near future, and we are actually developing technology, we are developing instruments to see what is this coming out. Is there any life there? That would be very exciting to find something like that. Another place is Europa. Europa is the moon of Jupiter. Again, it's a very old planetary body. And it's thick ice. We actually, scientists believe that there is under the thick ice shell that there will be water ocean. How do you know? Again, with all these measurements sitting here, you can actually make a lot of prediction. And we believe that there is this ice shell. The ice shell is thickness about 15 kilometers to 100 kilometers. So if there is a liquid water ocean, there is a mantle like our planet Earth that is keeping it liquid. Is there life in that water? So we are planning a mission to Europa. So if we, NASA comes to you, the school, and say, okay, we are planning a trip to Europa. So what kind of instrument you are going to send to find it that is life in that water ocean? What will be your answer? I cannot see any of you, sorry, with a blue bright, this light, or dark in front of me. So what will be your answer? Okay, obvious answer is you send a drill, drill a hole, load a bucket and see if there is any fish. So here in Calcutta, we get all these like fish, right? The problem is, it takes seven years to go to Europa. And when you send an instrument out there, total amount of power available to us is about 300 to 400 watts. That is three to four light bulbs. How can you drill a hole of 15 kilometers to 100 kilometers through ice in the 400 watts of power? It's not possible. Then you have to think differently. Then you have to come up with new ideas that how can you measure it. It turns out that you know what happens is there are a lot of cracks in here and the water sits all the way to the top. But since it's so cold, it freezes. But Europa is close to Jupiter, and Jupiter has a very high magnetic field, that is high radiation environment. So that radiation sputters all the material in the atmosphere. And you can actually do high resolution spectroscopy to see what are those materials that's coming out. Is there any organic? Organics does not necessarily mean life, but that is precursor to life. So we are sending a mission that will be launched sometime in next year. We have a lot of instruments there to actually find out what is this, what is there, is there a possibility of life in Europa. And of course, you all know that we keep going back to Mars. So recently, we have sent Perseverance, and India also has Mongolian mission. So why, why do we go back to Mars? The reason is that Mars, in its early history, resembles very much like our planet Earth. But the question is, was Mars ever habitable? Was there life on Mars at any point of time? Is there life on Mars today? We don't know that answer. And that's why we are actually sending a lot of instruments. Over the years, you can see that we had sent a rover, Pathfinder, in 1996, Spirit and Opportunity 2003, Curiosity 2011. Many of you know that Chandrayaan 3 was very successful. They landed on the moon. But landing on Mars is even more challenging because it takes seven months to go to Mars. But how do we send something to Mars and how do we land something on Mars? It's extremely challenging. Let's just give you a little bit of an example of what happened. Look at this. The latest Mars mission, the Perseverance rover, was launched on, you can see here, July 30th, 2020. And at that time, things have to be aligned perfectly. You can launch to Mars only once in two years. That's when the distance between Mars and our planet Earth is the least. So it was when it was launched, Mars was here. As you can see, Mars is going around on this orbit. And then when it's launched, our this is the spacecraft, it has to be arriving here at the at this point at the right time. Because just before Mars comes here, we have to arrive at that point. And then the cruising speed of our spacecraft is about 77,000 kilometers per hour a huge number. With that speed, we cannot really enter in the Martian gravity field. So we have to slow down. We slow down to about 20,000 kilometers per hour at this point when we're here. And as Mars comes from behind and catches up, we insert it 
in wash your body. And then what happens is you can see here this happened just before Mars came. We actually were, were there and we are slowing down and Mars came. We actually entered in the Martian uh, in gravity field and that is not enough. Then Mars atmosphere is just 1%, the density of Martian atmosphere is 1% of, of our planet Earth. So it does not slow down that easily. The friction is not enough. So we have to enter at a very particular angle, about 11 degrees, and so that it gets maximum friction. And then as it's going down, we launch a parachute. But parachute is generally don't launch at very high speed because it will break. But we don't have any option. So we have to have a lot of experiment. Mojave Desert, uh, very close to California, where we live, we are doing experiments to make sure that the parachutes work. There are big parachutes, and then slowly it goes down, but we have to spin them, use some thrusters to slow us down even further. And then when the thruster comes, problem is, if you keep on using the thruster and you go very, go, go very close to the ground, mass a lot of dust and stones on the ground. It will all come up and destroy our instrument. So we cannot do that. So we are our, scratching our head. How can we do that? What we need to do, we came up with an idea of using a sky crane. Think of it, so crazy. Just who uses a crane on another planet from a spacecraft? But that was the only option we had. And when we, someone came up with this idea, we thought, no, it might not work. Then we did experiments and said, yeah, let's go for it. And we were successful, then the crane slowly towards the spacecraft on the ground. And these spacecraft, these thrusters, they fly away so that it doesn't fall on the instrument, on the rover. And that's how we land. And this is the Persephone rover. They, just before it was sent to Cape Carnival for launch in our lab, if you come and visit us at KPL, I'll show you uh, this lab. This is a huge facility where they actually put everything together. This is a clean room, huge clean, clean room. Uh, this is where we actually uh, put everything together. And look at this. Look at this, all these pictures. If I tell you these pictures from here on planet Earth, you might believe. But no, they're all from Mars. These are pictures taken by the rovers on Mars. Look at this. I can say that this is one of the roads in the monsoon in Kolkata. You might believe. But you know, if you look at the terrain here, we get this kind of terrain only when there is flowing water. You can get this kind of terrain only when it's flowing water. Which means at one point of time on Mars there is flowing water. But if we go there today, we don't see flowing water. The question is what happened? Where did the water go? Can it happen to us on our planet Earth? What can we do to prevent it? So they are, these are very important questions. A lot of people ask, why are we spending so much money to send something to Mars? People are hungry on, you know, uh, on our planet. But we have big problems to solve. And this is, these are one of those big questions that we have. And as I was talking about the water, water is very important for life. And it turns out that, you know, is there enough water in the universe? That, that was the question. So that there can be life outside? The question is yes. You know, it's very interesting story that we, we found, using again the Herschel Hypa instrument that I was involved in, that we, are, we found that we form very star like very young stars, water molecules are coming out at very high speed, 200,000 kilometers per hour. If you fire a bullet from AK 47 rifle, the speed of that is only 80, uh, you know, 2,500 kilometers per hour. So these water molecules are coming out at 80 times faster. And they find a way to recombine. And then, total amount, they are finding that. Total amount of water in the Amazon River is being produced per second in one of these runs. So we have huge water. The universe is flooded with water. We have enough water. Maybe there will be life there. Water is very interesting because when Earth was formed, there was no water on Earth. Did you all know? Scientists believe that comets brought water to us. Comets has that carry a lot of water. But we have not proven it 100%. We have measured only about 
8 to 12 measurements we need. So, question is how do you prove that comet is not what you want? So, as a student, you should always ask questions because if someone says, okay, comet is not what you want, so how do you prove? How do you know? How do you know is that it turns out water has different kinds of water up there. The water that we drink every day, that is H216. Oxygen has different isotopes. 16 is the one of the most stable isotopes, so that is more stable water. But the other kinds of water, H217, H218, HDO, one hydrogen, one deuterium, and one oxygen also makes water. And if you take the ratio of abundance, how much of different kinds of water is there on planet Earth, they match very closely with some of the uh, uh, comets. They are called Jupiter planets. So we are actually building instruments to answer that for once and all, if comet is not what it was. I'll talk a little bit about that technology later on. So we also did a lot of other technology. Most recently, you must have heard that we went to an asteroid, collected some materials, and brought it back to us. How interesting is that? So we did that called NASA's Osiris Rex, and that we was launched in 2016. Only recently got this material that you can see. This is the, uh, that asteroid, you do a very close picture of that, and you collected some of the material. This is the size of that. And that one is actually in between Earth and Venus, the asteroid was. And this is the actual material that we are collecting. This is very interesting. This is the first time we actually got some material from another asteroid. Uh, why is it important? Because looking at them, we will be able to understand you know, how our planets were formed at the beginning of the universe. So we have just started analyzing it because it is very recent. Last month, we got this material. Another thing you, you many of you know that we actually launched something called a mission called Psyche that is going to and one of the asteroids. It's a completely metal asteroid. It has metal of iron and nickel. It's very, very exciting. And what happened is, this was like our own planet at one point of time, but you know, a lot of uh, asteroids and other materials hit that, and then it lost all its top core, uh, top layer, and what is left is just the metal core. And we're sending something, this one is in between uh, Jupiter and Mars. It will take a long time for us to go there and you know, study this. Asteroid. But recently you heard that we did uh, last week there was a news that we did using this mission, using this mission, we did the longest laser communication. Because we had an experiment of laser communication. In the future, we are trying to increase the bandwidth so that we can send more data. And we did the laser communication for the first time. It is actually 80 times, distance 80 times more than the distance of Earth and Moon. So that's what we did. So we are, and also we are using electric propulsion for the first time for this mission. So that will be very, very exciting as well. So another thing, of course, I tell you that oftentimes you read fake news on WhatsApp that one asteroid, asteroid is going to hit planet Earth, is all going to get destroyed. And whenever they have the fake news, you realize they, they write, NASA said that. As if, if NASA says that's not true. That actually puts a lot of pressure on us because we have to make sure that whatever we say is all correct 100%. So here, we actually are tracking a lot of asteroids and trying to find out, are they going to come and hit us? Are they going to destroy us? So that is recently we did a mission called DART mission. I'll tell you a little bit about it. And if you look at that, the lot of asteroids, we track them and they can come and hit us. Well, most of them are very small, like 25 meters of size. If you look at them, there are possibility of they coming and hitting us about once in 100 years. They're small. And the damage they will do a little bit, you know, there will be some, most of them will burn because of the size in the atmosphere. So not much damage is going to do. But if there is a bigger one, 140 size, they come here about once in 20,000 years. And then we have found about 39% of them, about 225,000 of them are there. So you can actually keep track of them. 
So one of the big ones coming and hitting us, the probability is extremely low. So next time you need a WhatsApp message that something is coming on our way and tomorrow our heart will be destroyed, don't believe it. And don't send me a WhatsApp message asking, is it true? All my friends do that. So it is not happening. However, on that, you know, we are prepared. We are preparing ourselves. NASA did a mission of DART. There is two asteroids. You can go in for digging ones. It's a big one. And the small one is going around it. So what we did in this DART mission, we sent a spacecraft and hit it directly off one of the smaller asteroids and changed the orbit of that. So that was the idea. Can we send a spacecraft, hit an asteroid, and change the orbit so that it would come and hit us. So that's what we wanted to do. And you can see that the, this mission was about 570 kilograms. And this is the bigger one. This is the size of the We wanted to hit this one, 163 meters of diameter. And as it was going, it flows and flows. We actually took a lot of good pictures. You can see this is how it looks like. So this is the beauty of all this, that when you look at this asteroid, how closely they resemble our own planet. So you can see here all these stones. You see, and what happened is that we hit the good side. It is not easy to go and hit a small asteroid in far places. But we did that. And originally the orbit of that asteroid was 11,055 minutes. And after we hit that, the orbit time changed to 11,023 minutes. We confirmed that. And that is enough to move an asteroid away from us. So now we have a technology. In future, if something is really coming on the way, we will be able to move away. And recently, we are also using a lot of new technologies, something called CubeSat. I can see Sukhajit is sitting here. He's from IEM, UM, and I think Ministry of India. So they have been working in their you know, college with, with the students developing some of the technologies. So in NASA, as well as other space, uh, it poses a lot of challenges because how do you fit everything in such a small volume? You know, it's, so we have done what sent two CubeSat to Mars for communication purposes from Mars. That was the first time we used uh, a CubeSat to have a relay station because as the spacecraft goes down on Mars, we do not have a direct communication for about 10 minutes. So to avoid that, we actually did that. You can see here animation how the tubes are just small tubes that are thrown out from the main mission. They just throw us out. And then you can see here, then we go out. And this is what the Mars Marco that I mentioned. And you can see the tubes that have their own solar panels. They deploy. And this is a, an, an antenna. It's called reflector antenna. Some people who actually work in this area, they know. This reflector is a foldable reflector antenna that you can deploy and do the communication. So that's what we did. You can see here the other one coming out. And this one we deploy. I show that to you on the deploy. You can see this these antenna. These are the antenna actually that they write. These antennas, what they're doing is you have a flat surface that elect electrically it makes a parabola, a parabola. So effectively, electrically makes a parabola so that you can do some communication. So that's what we are doing here. And as the spacecraft goes down, and it communicates directly with these CubeSats, and they send the data back. So that's how we get this done. So we, can, we are making a lot of instruments in this small volume of CubeSat. You can see here, this is called you know, radar instrument that we have built is called Ray Q. So this is again a small spacecraft this size, but we have to put a 50 centimeter antenna in that. The question was, how do you put a 50 centimeter antenna in a very such small volume so that you can deploy and then you gather all the data? So here we can see that we see the antenna when it's deployed. So that I'll show you how we put this thing deployed. Can someone click on that? If you can click on that picture, there's a video there. 
get the mouse there. You can just click. Just a click. Yeah, there is. There is a mouse there. Yeah. You should just click there. Yeah. Just click. You can see this is how it is deployed. There is a spring loaded structure. And this is a K band. People who know K band is about 30 gigahertz. It's not easy to make this kind of antenna at this frequency. This is a wheel we throw it. Again, you can see most of the more kind of frequency band. And you can see here the antenna is deployed, and there will be a sub detector deploying again. And then the, 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 the propagation happens. It's a beautiful way of deploying mechanisms. So, what I'm trying to show here that it is not about one person doing design and implementation. I have to work with the electromagnetic engineer, we have to work with the mechanical engineer, we have to work with the thermal engineer so that everything comes together. So teamwork is the key for success. So always keep that in mind. Just do that. So I was mentioning that we have developed a new technology for CubeSat based, but we have we do not know about that whether comets block what the QR. We have not proven it hundred percent. So I actually developed, I wrote a proposal to NASA and I call it WhatsApp name of the instrument is what's up because it's water hunting advanced terahertz spectrometer on ultra small platform because we are trying to answer the question what's up is water and in that we are this is very small a volume instrument that we are trying to do this is the block diagram because as, as i said there are different kinds of water you can see here i list different kinds of water and the frequencies so this is the instrument trying to detect all those high resolution spectroscopy that we are trying to do so many of you are here, the students, one of the things that you have to realize, you have to really think about, how do we start building a mission? When we are trying to answer a science question, how do we go about it? What is the process? So I explain a little bit. What happens is, we are trying to answer a big question. It starts with a science question, like, did comets got what you want? This is the science question we are trying to answer. The next question will be, to answer that science question, what kind of measurements you can do? As I said, one of the measurements we can do is measure different kinds of water. The next question will be, to do those measurements, what kind of instruments that you need? What kind of frequencies you are going to choose? And then next will be, what are the technology gaps we have? Which means, what, are, what is not available today that we need to develop so that I can build that instrument? That will do the measurement, that will answer the science question. So this is how all this is done of the, together for NASA. So we build some antennas, you can see the 550 gigahertz, actually this is a terahertz, extremely difficult to make this kind of antenna. And we build some uh, lens antennas as well. And we also build some of the switches. You know what happens is that you go higher frequencies, beam waves only coming to fusion today. Nowadays, people have to start working on the unique ways. Even there, we don't have you know, low frequency instrument that we have components we have to want to bail for, like a switch. Electromagnetic switch is not available, like uh, lower frequency. We have to build a lot of new technologies, we have a lot of patent on this, that how we can make these kind of switches in big guides. And we build, this is a, a patented new technology that we developed in our lab, where we can actually move some web-wide structure in the piezoelectric motors. It's very tiny motor that moves things and between switches. And also we are using the technology of cell phone technology that we call it. You know, semiconductor technology that is available in your phone. If you say, what do we need to do? If you try to uh, send your iPhone to space, it won't last even a millisecond. It will be destroyed. Why? Because our you know, space is a very harsh environment, a lot of radiation out there. So we have to, we are developing our own the semiconductor based cell phone kind of technology that can be sent to space. We have done that in our lab, and this is the instrument that we put together. This is a what what instrument that I was talking about. You can see here all this thing came together, and we this is how tiny this instrument is. You can see this is in our lab, the entire instrument. Here, I'm standing there to just show the size of this. It's kind of two box size, this size instrument. 
And then we wanted to fly on a balloon to do some experiments. There is a place in US near New Mexico called Fort, Fort Sumner. And there, there is a place is very close to Roswell. If you do a Google search of Roswell, you will find that people in Roswell believe the first alien landed was. And since we are sending a balloon mission to test it out, we put our own alien, we call it Bob the Alien, on our, on our balloon payload so that when people in Roswell find it, where the balloon drop lands there, they will find another alien. That's why you did that. It was very successful. Right now, we are waiting to get a ride. So in future, we are building multiple copies of these instruments. So when we, in future, at least, if you saw that we are actually throwing it out on the main mission, you can send this through this small instrument. And as suppose we are going to Mars, we cross out on the way, and then we move to all these comets and do the measurement and answer for once and all. So I take next five minutes and show you something else, and then I'll end. I want to give more uh, time for question and answer. Many of you know that when we launched uh, uh, this Perseverance rover, we also had a helicopter for engineering the helicopter. This is the helicopter that is shown here in getting final data before it is mounted. So the question is, why helicopter to Mars? The reason is that we send a robot, but the robot has limited mobility. It cannot go anywhere to do all the science experiments. So if you have something, a helicopter or a drone, whatever you want to call it, it can take off, go around, do reconnaissance, and send the data back to the robot, and then the robot can go and do other experiments. We can do that. So what is the problem? We can see helicopter flying on our skies all the time. So then what is the problem in flying a helicopter on Mars? The reason is, Mars atmosphere, as I said, is 1%. The density of Mars atmosphere is 1% of planet Earth, which means there is not enough you know, lift for the helicopter to actually fly. So when we fly a helicopter on our planet Earth, the blades rotate at 600 RPM, revolutions of minute. But for Mars, it has to rotate at 2,500 to 3,000 RPM. It's a very, very challenging environment. So this is a self-sustaining, we want to call it a tech demo, technology demonstration. Uh, in English, call it basically autonomous vehicle. It takes off on its own and flies and goes there. And NASA said, OK, you can have three to four flights <coughs> maximum, because it's not going to survive, perhaps. So it will be about two to three minutes duration maximum. It will have go height about 40 meters or so, that's all. Just whether it works or not. So we put everything together. So the instrument is mounted under the belly of the Perseverance rover. You can see that these are the pictures taken by the rover itself. The rover has a camera and it took all this photograph. You can see here the cover was dropped first and slowly the helicopter was lowered down on the ground. These are real photographs, these are not animation photographs, these are real photographs from Mars. And you can see here that the helicopter was put down, and then you can see that helicopter for the first time on its own, and these are the track marks of the rover that moved away. And the rover took the photograph, you can see here, about 40 meter distance from the helicopter, it was standing there and taking the videos. So I'll show you the first flight of the, so this is the first flight of that helicopter that happened in 2021, and there was a camera mounted on the helicopter, and you can see here, this is the shadow of the helicopter as the helicopter is taking off. And so you cannot see here, this is the real altimeter data of that. So basically, the idea was that helicopter will fly for about 40 seconds, it will go about 10 feet, about you know, 3 meters up, and make a 93 degree turn, and then come down. That was the first demonstration, because we have never flown anything on another planet before. So that was very, very challenging. And this is the, you can see here, when you the very first flight. And this video was taken by the Perseverance rover. You can see here the blades are moving. And then the helicopter took off. And it will make a 93 degrees turn. People ask, why 93 degrees? We say, why not? Any degrees will be fast. We just, 
you can see here it turned and then it come down at the same spot. So that was amazing, it was really some big achievement. And, and as I said, that we wanted to have three to four flights. As of today, we have made 66 flights of this helicopter. We are trying to break this instrument. We are trying to fly as fast as possible. We are trying to go as high as possible. We are trying to go as far as possible and trying to see when it will break. But this small thing is not breaking down. So we are here that NASA has extended the mission of this life. So this is what I am going to end here. And thank you, thank you very much.